beautiful eyes You lock me in your gaze And try though I might I cannot look away you, You're not what I expected to find And now I'm forgetting why I should run from your side Dear Stream Elements, could you please be a little more verbose in telling me what it is you object to when I, I, I you know, appreciate you trying to protect the channel and chat and such, but not knowing why someone got timed out is uh, an interesting thing, for sure. I don't know if it's the caps, the exclamation point, the combination of two, or if it just doesn't like the word first. You know, it, it says it timed you out for 15 seconds. So, yeah, I don't know. I don't know what it's doing. It's just weird. Ah, uh, so anyway, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to the TTRPG Theater. I'm your friendly neighborhood, uh, Phantom NJ. And I will be, uh, yeah, I, I will be your host for the next hour or so. Let's see how far we go. <laughs> well, okay, so I, I guess it has degrees in what it considers, um, you know, a bad thing. That's, I, 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 you know, I can't complain about that, I suppose. I don't know. Been kind of a, an interesting week, to say the least. 
And, you know, I, I was trying to figure out, I suddenly realized, hey, you know, today's Thursday. I should probably have come up with a stream idea. And, you know, I was searching and searching. I was like, well, what do I want to talk about? And, hey, 491 Phantom, good to see you, uh, my brother Phantom, you know, out of all the Phantoms. <laughs> oh, boy. Yeah, uh, like I said, it, it, all it said was 15 second timeout by Stream Elements. It did not give me a reason. It just, you know, that, that was it. But, you know, it, it, it's one of those things where, uh, and I just realized that I am not really in focus on, um, well, I am in focus. You can tell this is a really, really professional thing I've got going on here. Mm hmm You know, in terms of the screen fitting the windows and whatnot and how I don't notice these things until I'm like halfway through a stream today. I finally actually caught it. Yeah. Highly professional. Absolutely. The problem is, you know, I mean, it's a one person show. So technically I'm paying myself and I am really horrible at pay about payroll. So I don't know. Maybe I am professional. Maybe I'm not. I Seems like the word professional is getting used uh, early and often these days. So while we are on a 30 second ad break, uh, uh, let's talk about, well, in case you're not on an ad break, uh, let's talk about our sponsor. We are sponsored by Troll Lord Games, uh, makers of Castles and Crusades, Amazing Adventures, and uh, other fantastic content, including. Uh, the republishing of the last of uh, Gary Gygax's works from you know shortly before he, the few years before he passed away, uh, the Fantasy World series and such. Uh, currently, I think that well, they're all in Kickstarter. Though I think the you know the they're all past the uh, the finale of it in terms of um, you know joining the Kickstarter. So. Now we are currently in a uh, wait mode for being able to do pre-orders and uh, I don't know if there's going to be a join late for them. Um, but you know, so much content coming and there, they will be releasing the uh, non OGL version of their core books. Uh, the castle keepers guide, the player's handbook and monsters and treasures uh, coming in the Kickstarter is coming in June. If you sign up for notification for the Kickstarter, you will receive a PDF of the uh, the non-OGL player's handbook. And I believe that PDF is going to be released the day the Kickstarter opens, uh, if, I, if I read that correctly. So that's really, really cool. Uh, we do have a Troll Lord Games giveaway. Uh, exclamation point ticket is the is what you need to enter. And it uh, will give you, you know, a chance to win a $10 gift card towards any digital product from their website. Uh, so, you know, put it towards any of the adventures, any of the books uh, in PDF format. And, you know, your chances of winning are tend to be pretty good around here. Uh, so I, I, I encourage you to do it. Um, you know, I'm, I'm lucky enough to have them as a sponsor. Uh, what does it say? Are the maker, are the makers are of? Yeah, thank you, Pat. How long have I had that like that? That's ah, fantastic. Really professional, top-notch organization I'm running here. I really should speak to management and give them a piece of my mind. But yeah, uh, do do. -do. I want to change that right now while I'm feeling inspired keeping with the theme uh, are the makers there we go all right thank you for pointing that out I'm I'm glad to have gotten out 
can can I afford to do what? Talk to management? <laughs> yeah, you know, I I've heard management is just terrible around here. The 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 staff get away with everything. The you know the management does nothing, and it it it, it all goes to hell really quick. Uh, you know the I I, I some someone is running this and it is not management of any sort. I can promise you that there is no management going on here. But it, it was, you know, sitting here this week and trying to figure out. <laughs> there, there, there's an irony in that statement, four ninety one Phantom, in that when somebody called something a Mickey Mouse organization. I was referring to my favorite hockey team, the local hockey team. So, yeah, uh huh. That was Gretzky referring to the Devils. And the funny thing about that was the Devils would win uh, three Stanley Cups, and Gretzky never won another one after that statement. So, there you have it, folks. Um, but yeah, there's also, you know, a bit of irony in the fact that I was trying to figure out what I wanted to talk about this week. And, uh, you know, it hit me. It's like, well, I'm searching for inspiration. And inspiration is something uh, in terms of TTRPGs. When, when you've been running games long enough. So when, when you do a mostly RP game, how do you find characters, personality? And how do you know when it's too much? Are you talking from a player perspective, Pat, or a uh, or a game master perspective, or both? So, from a player's perspective, you know, a, 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 as a player, I I think the only time personality becomes too much is when you're at the point where your character's personality is just utterly dominating the game and it's like not leaving room for anyone else um to join in on it um yeah if you're if you're playing off of someone or your you know your character's personality works well with the group and you know it's easy to role play with that character i don't know that there's a thing such a thing as too much um i i mean i suppose I suppose it can get to the realm of too silly or too dark. Sometimes sometimes it's a matter of making sure that the personality fits the game. Uh, that's not to say that a serious game can't have, you know, something of a jokester, but, but if your character is just completely silly all the time in what is otherwise a, you know, a, a rather grim adventure, uh, it's... You know, instead of being like that little light in the darkness, it's kind of just completely ruining the vibe of the game. Then that's too much. Um, it's a tricky thing. Uh, I, I, the things to be mindful of for me is, you know, making sure that one, you're you're not just going completely to the point where you're absolutely one hundred percent diametrically against the vibe of the game itself um and after that uh you know beyond that is making sure and this is probably even more important because th this if you're if you're failing this one you're you might probably are on your way to uh you know being against the vibe of the game is making sure your character's personality allows for other players one to get their chance to shine and to, you know, have the ability to role play with your character. As long as you're doing that, um, you know, you're, you're in pretty good shape. It's a good question though. It's a, and, and from a DMs per, uh, perspective, um, you're, you're right. It, it does take a certain, um, you know, <laughs> ability to just like handle multiple, you know, multiple distinct personalities. And there are times when there are times when I'm really feeling like I'm on top of this. And there are times when I, I slip and I realize that I have not done nearly enough uh, to do justice to separating the various personalities. 
Um, I, I probably I need to do a better job of making sure that I pro- have notes for myself. So to remind myself of what the personality of a given character is supposed to be, uh, it's easier when they're only going to be there for a short bit, uh, because then it's you know you you get in you you deal with that character for however long and then they're gone. Uh, it's when you have an NPC who is, uh, you know, if if you have an NPC running with the party for some reason. Uh, make and especially if you have more than one. Uh, hey, Lord Forth. Um, it, it you know then then it becomes trickier making sure that you keep them distinct and it's not just a matter. Or or I mean honestly, if and if it's something you're not good at, um, you know I, I'm not great with voices. I I try to do, I try to do tone more than I do voices, uh, especially for like multiple characters. I I don't. Uh, it's not you know voices it do- doesn't come naturally to me so it's something i really have to work at um and i end up having like a certain type of voice just for general character types or general character ancestry species whatever you want to call them uh races uh but you know having distinct within the, that is a more difficult task so then it becomes more about personality. But if, if you have trouble even doing that, then it's just a matter of making sure your players know which character they're talking to. Uh, you know, it, you're not, it doesn't require, well, 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 it's always cool that, you know, when a, uh, a GM can take on those different personalities, uh, it's not a hard and fast requirement that they do. It really isn't. And I, I say that because you don't want to be scaring off GMs just because they don't really have a, you know, have have the ability to do so. Hey, Lord Kazuma, good to see you, Jay. Um, so, um, <laughs> use wigs. <laughs> uh, Lord Fourth, you missed a part of where we're talking about, uh, yeah, as far as management and. You know the 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 level of professionalism in this thing. I I, I you know I, I I would need to get a budget and I would need to make a budget and um then I'd have to learn how to choose wigs and use them and so on and so forth and then keep them all nearby and make sure that I'm putting on the right one. That that's a step too far. I I love the idea. I mean that that'd be great. Just changing changing uh, characters. With with a simple hair change, That'd be an interesting way to go. <laughs> I'm sure I'm sure that would be entertaining too. Um, but you know, you do what you can do. So let, let's talk about inspiration. Um, you know, I, I I've been running games for forty something years now, um, and I, I I think one of the things that I often struggle with. And this, oddly enough, it pertains more to like one shots and, you know, short adventures, maybe two or three session uh, long adventures um, as opposed to campaigns, because campaigns tend to have a more a more more of a story. And that story, because of the fact that I like to do sandbox adventures with that, um, I, I get helped out a lot by the players with their choices and the way they are. Uh, their characters want to, you know, uh, interact with the story and such. Um, but for for things like one shot adventures, I'm not gonna lie, it is it is difficult to find something to do with my ca- uh, players, especially at low levels. And I I like, you know, generally speaking, I like the low level adventures because of the fact that. Uh, players general uh, usually have a better grip on their characters. Now I'm running a lot of castles and crusades, so you know, other than the casters, it it really is easy for the players to get a handle on what their characters can do. Um, you know, they're they're they don't have a large list of abilities, and then it's a matter of you know how much they can let go of what's on their character sheet and try things. You know, taking advantage of the siege engine and such. And just let their imagination run wild. Um, at the same time, there comes a point where you feel like everything you've done 
feels like it's something that you've done a hundred times before. And it feels like, you know, they're, they're right or wrong. It, it's, it, it can be very difficult to get over that feeling of sameness. Um, I mean, it, it's nice having a large list of players because then at least you feel that, okay, you might've done this a bunch of times before, but not for this group. Um, you know, how finding ways to make it so that it's not the same old thing over and over. And um, a lot of that is, you know, a lot of it comes from the part that, especially when you're playing at a certain level and with the lower levels, there are only so many things that you can throw at the characters. Um, there are, you know, there's only so many, so many creatures, so many things that can be done at that level. Um, you know, I, I actually almost ended up, uh, accidentally one-shotting my, or not one-shotting, TPKing my party, uh, in adventure with the first thing that I sent at them because I didn't. Um, you know, I, I, I didn't expect the damage output to happen the way it did in like the first round and thankfully they survived, but it also made me reevaluate what I was doing for the rest of the one shot. Um, it was a creature they hadn't fought yet, so that was cool. Um, but you know, it, it, they're, they're just getting to that point where I can start doing new things with them and that's, that's cool. Um, one sleep spell, yeah, you know, it's uh, that's that's one of those things where I, I look at it and it's like enemy casters, and enemy casters is one of those ways where you can switch things up. But you know, if a party's not used to dealing with enemy casters, enemy casters, knowing knowing what I know about how casters can uh, wreck a, wreck a GM's plans, because I do that often with my casters. Uh, the one the one thing I I enjoy is very very tactical use of uh, the spells that I have at lower at lower levels, um, especially with my illusionist. My illusion I love playing illusionist in Castle and Crusades. I have a lot of fun just controlling a battlefield with those spells. Now the the problem comes in the fact that knowing what I know about the spells and spell usage, it would be real easy for me to wreck a party with enemy casters um so you know while i want to have more of them uh i also need to make sure that i better understand my party and their ability to get past and deal with those types of situations uh because again you know i it, i want it to be i want it to be a fight that they can win not necessarily not not to say that they're absolutely definitely going to win, but you know, if if I'm going to throw a caster at them and I'm not sure if they're going to handle it right and lack of handling it right, it means it's definitely going to be a TPK. I got to I got to think long and hard on what I'm doing there. Um whether that's the right way to look at it, the wrong way, I don't know. Um you know, I'm still I've got a whole bunch of players that have you know varying degrees of ttrpg experience um actually i'm kind of enjoying the one, the one party because they have they have quite a bit of experience i'm, I'm getting a, few, a better feel for them uh they, they've also all been playing for years and years in various games so i i've got more confidence that they'll figure out a way uh but you know some of my other parties i'm not entirely sure that one caster won't just make things be a very very bad day um, you know, the other, the other thing is, well, objectives, you know, what is the objective? Uh, you know, there's, I, I, I think, I feel like I've done the save X person, uh, from the clutches of whoever a thousand times. And I probably have, um, you know, uh, retrieve said item, um, explore said building, uh, you know, uh, forgotten building. Uh, you know, and, and you look and you try to find things to make it different. Um, 
and try to find inspiration on, on ways to change it up. Um, and I, I think this is where doing one shots, having it be part of the larger campaign has helped. Uh, you know, because if, when I was doing one shots all on their own, uh, it, it, it really did feel like I was doing, you know, getting to do the same thing over again. Having, having the potential for ongoing consequences has, has changed the game a little. Um, it, it's, it's, you know, because now, now the decisions that the characters make matter a little more, assuming that I'm tracking these accurately. And, uh, you know, I, I've tried to do it as best I can. <laughs> oh man revenge on a spellcaster I, I like this idea yeah um and you know i mean when you're when you're searching for inspiration there there, there are things I, I mean there's all the usual places and i you know for me for inspiration comes in so many forms there's you know there's the books that i've read over the years and i've read so many i mean um, you know, in the nineties, when they first started releasing the, or the late, you know, the mid eighties, maybe early eighties, I don't remember when they first started, maybe 84. So, um, probably till the mid nineties, you know, uh, I read all the Dragonlance, I, I read, I didn't read all the Dragonlance novels, Dragonlance Chronicles. I, I enjoyed Chronicles. I kind of enjoyed Legends and then. You know, anything that wandered off uh, stories about the the heroes of the Lance, I never really got into. And even then, reading about them kind of got old after a while. Um, it's a series that, for me, uh, I enjoyed at the time. It really didn't, it really aged poorly. Um, the Forgotten Realms novels, um, you know, I was very heavy into them. Um, for, you know, and to the point where I had, I probably own 60 to 70 of them. Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, you know, I, when they first started coming out, I, Dark Walker and Moonshay was, by Douglas Niles was the first one that I remember getting. Um, I enjoyed the early um, Icewind Dale novels. Um, I enjoyed it a hell of a lot less once it became Drizzt Dorden all the time all day all the time it I, I i think they really lost the plot with that um you know once it became all about Drizzt, it, it just it, it it really i read them and i just kept getting more annoyed and i just finally stopped myself um you know they they did different series about different areas of the realms which was kind of cool there is yeah jay you're you're right about that that that's also an issue I'm just Driz Drizit is, you know, the male equivalent of Mary Sue character. I mean, for the love of God, he it's I I, I could rant all day about Drizit. <laughs> I I I might have been the one person that I knew that my main complaint about Drizit wasn't that everybody wanted to play Drizit in in D. &D. Um, so as far as Greyhawk books, I never read the, you know, I never read the Gord series. Um, I've never owned any of them. Um, I've, I've heard, I, I, I've heard some interesting stories about them. I mean, of Jay's, you know, on Lord Gazama's stream, they've talked about them a fair bit. I, I, you know, I, I have, I, I can say, uh, I will admit that I own one of the Rose Estes novels, um, The Eyes Have It. I read it. I don't remember anything from it. Um, I, I got to tell you, though, I did enjoy, for what they were, I, I, I did enjoy a lot of the novels that they released. I think it was the early 90s, might have been the mid 90s, when they released the set of novels on uh, that basically took on the classic adventures. So you had the Temple of Elemental Evil, you had White Plume Mountain, um, and such. They, they, they. I thought they did. You know, they, they were wasn't much thought required. Uh, they were kind of fun. Um, you know, they they were quick read, and they were you know they covered familiar territory. So, 
Uh, you know, I, I, I thought they were, it, it was kind of cool. The guy with the demon hand. Yeah, Jay's going to have to answer that one because I don't remember. The Black Rat Inn channel on YouTube. Okay, Spider-Man, I'll have to take a look at that because um, I, I, I think about that. I'll be honest with you. So for the Forgotten Realms novels, there there are a couple of things that, uh, a couple of ways that they lost me. Um, I mean, obviously, I, I've been ranting a bit about Drizzt Dorden and uh, that character. I just, uh, I, I've got issues with it. I, I really do. It's just not, I don't find him interesting at all. Um, but you know, there, there's, there's, there. I've got a number of complaints about the character and the fact that the series and all those books ended up focusing it on him. I thought he was the least interesting character in the entire saga, to be honest with you. I mean, Regis the Halfling was more interesting to me than Drizzt was. Um, the, you know, in in terms of the novels, Forgotten Realms. Uh, there were three things that lost it for me. And I say this as much as I love, I, I love having, Ed, uh, seeing Ed Greenwood and, uh, you know, getting to talk to him at Gary Khan and seeing him on Jay's channel. When they started releasing the Elminster novels was, was another thing. Cause you've, the last thing I want in my games, you know, in my, in my novels is a demigod wandering around. And, you know, when, when the demigod becomes part of the, uh, you know, becomes part of the story in what is supposed to be a large venturing realm, it, it, it doesn't do anything for me. Um, and the more involved, you know, it was one of the things, the more involved it got, it, it, the, the less the realms became interesting. And then there was the time, the final straw for me. Uh, and and this was you know this one was probably the biggest one was the whole time of troubles with the uh you know the death of the gods and the ascension of new gods as part of the story which i i have to i'd have to force myself to go back and read them because i remember reading them at the time and you know Siric uh you know killing one of the gods and becoming a god and all that and i remember just thinking what the hell is this um, it was just, I, they were like, I'm like, okay, I, I really, I think I really am done with this now. Um, I mean, there were some, there was some interesting stuff like curse of the Azure bonds. I, I kind of enjoyed, um, you know, that, that one, that was one that was, uh, I thought was pretty, pretty good. It was, it was, it was something different, but it just spellfire was another one which was kind i thought was kind of interesting because it added a new dimension to to the adventure you know to the realms and such but yeah like uh, the the whole whole tw uh twilight of the gods or whatever that series was called i thought i thought it was just terrible uh, i didn't like anything about it um but again you know you you take inspiration where you can and you know if there's something in those stories that you can grab that that sounds kind of interesting sometimes it can be just as just as much a new take on uh either a certain enemy um counselors and kings i don't think i read i i think that might have come out afterwards i don't know that i read that particular one um i remember you know I, I remember reading the original Moonshe and actually also the second Moonshe Isle trilogy, which I didn't quite enjoy as much. Um, I did enjoy it. It, it, it took a, that one. I think I, I think it took me uh, until like the mid second book before I warmed up to it. But I, I did enjoy uh, the Moonshe Isle, the initial Moonshe Isle trilogy um, as a, you know, rather uh, Celtic feeling, um, you know, take so you know interesting things regarding druids and uh you know earth goddesses and uh thing, things of that nature it it 
it did inspire some ideas. Um, you know, having having a anagram for the uh, the the not anagram. Um, I can't think of the particular word, but a stand-in for you know the Great Hunt. Uh, it was kind of cool. Um. It was also, I think it was also the first time I remember seeing a beholder used in a novel, which was, uh, which was pretty damn cool. Um, and it, 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 you know, it also played off of the, you know, what happens when, uh, you know, when the, the faith, the, the faith of the realm, the, you know, the faith of the people and which is not centered on like a god with a you know a god or goddess by name but rather you know rather mother earth um starts to take over and drives out it starts to drive out the the faith the old faith as it were uh which is something that when you know you're dealing with like say the world of greyhawk is also a thing i mean you've got you've got the old faith um, you've got druids all over the place. Hell, the the most famous, probably you know, maybe not most famous, but one of the uh, most well known and probably in anybody's book who's ever uh, you know played played it or DM'd it uh, among their. It's got to be in their top ten, if not top five. Uh, Village of Hamlet. Uh, we'll leave the rest of the Temple of Elemental Evil aside for a moment. But hell, the village of Hamlet has has a druid right smack dab, uh, you know that their druid glade is right dab smack dab off the town square, which I thought was a really interesting placement. Uh, Dat sadness, thank you for entering the giveaway. Um, please, everyone, we do have the uh, the giveaway, the ten dollar gift card, uh, for Troll Lord Games, uh, towards Troll Lord Games digital products. Uh, exclamation point ticket to enter. Um, so, you know, I mean, like I said, you have the novels, um, uh, you know, of different types. And it doesn't even have to be D&D &D novels. I mean, there's, there's so many fantasy series to, to run from. If you like, I mean, and if you like politically driven, uh, adventures, um, uh, yeah, I mean, there's, there's novels, there's television shows, there's all kinds of stuff that you can take inspiration from. Um, you know, though though most of them probably won't apply to one shots. Sword of Truth, uh, it started off strong. I thought it started off strong. I don't. I mean, I, I, I guess there there are things that are probably uh, don't come off. Uh, you know, they're probably a little more. That didn't really age well, but I I, I like the characters. Um, it, it 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 got a little much. It got a very it got very preachy, which which was ended up being a problem. It it slowed things down. Like and it, it not only did it get preachy, but it got preachy to the point where he was beating you over the head of it over and over and over. Uh, I am not a fan of the Wheel of Time. I'm I'm okay with the show. I know the show changed a lot of things. Um, even the show hasn't really 100% grabbed me. I, I I think the show I'm enjoying some of the people playing the various characters that are helping it along. I I'm not a Wheel of Time fan. I I never was. Um, it. I you know I don't want to yuck anyone else's yum. So I'll I'll, I'll leave that there. Um. But yeah, I mean, whatever whatever novels you're reading, whatever you're enjoying, there, there's always you know. Actually, speaking of novels, I, I need to I need to give a shout out to for for D and D novels. I really enjoyed the Ravenloft novels, um the the series that they published uh with the yeah as far as Ravenloft back in the Domain of Dreads uh era the the second uh, second edition era uh where you had all these various you know you had all the various domains with their specific um you know dreadlords and the if most of the adventure a lot of the adventures um dealt with characters people living in those particular those particular realms it, you know some of them did focus or uh you know were at least partially focused on the 
whoever the Lord of the Domain was. Uh, some of them were just pe basically people trying to survive, and uh, it made for some great storytelling. It made for something different. Um, you know, a lot of these, again, and a lot of the these the uh, you know domains, uh, whoever was in charge of the given domain, a lot of them were ba you know basically stand-ins for characters from uh, you know from Earth Tales. You had a you had the whole Frankenstein's monster and you know Frankenstein type thing. You had uh, you know you had your Dracula, Strahd von Zadovich. Uh, uh, you know, you had you had a lich. You had all kinds, you know, all kinds of dreadlords of, of different types. Uh, some who, you know, some who could basically have been from one of you know Earth's fairy tales or Earth story, but um, some were something completely different. So the modern answer to inspiration seems to be rolling a plot table. Well, you're you're you know. There is something to that, and and you know I I don't know whether that's necessarily a bad thing at times. Sometimes because I'll tell you something. Um, there were even back in the AD and D one E days, um, there were supplements that were built around the idea of role, and I think even possibly even in some of the official sources where you could basically put together an adventure by rolling rolling on tables. Um, you know, it, it, it's not really even a new thing. I think, I think now that there's so many people playing, uh, and so many people trying, you know, people wanting to DM or run some type of game because, you know, somebody needs to, and, uh, you know, the number of players probably greatly outnumbers the available GMs, uh, that you, you any, anything that works for coming up with an adventure um is all right i mean you you do you use it as a starting point it's not going to make uh, do the everything for you but i i can see that i mean i i can see that you know uh, a lot of modern tools taking advantage of that and and the interesting thing is you know it, it's the the issue for inspiration it i don't even it for me it's not even just related Strictly to a you know fa to fantasy games, um, you know. Let's talk about science fiction games. Uh, let's talk about let's talk about horror. Uh, you know how how do you find inspiration for something really different from a horror perspective? Uh, when you have you know we we've we've gone you know we've lived through years and years of I I, I mean I would say the seventies is when horror really became really dark and you know the the it, the the deaths on screen uh you know i mean that's not to say horror didn't exist before then but it was kind of like all right you know the you you saw something close in and maybe afterwards there would be screaming or whatever but you know it starting with like things like uh halloween and movies like that where you saw people actively getting killed and you have so much of that to go through. It's like, well, all right, trying to find stuff that seems interesting and new um, can be challenging. It's how do you, you know, how do you make it something new and fresh in that realm? Uh, and at the same time, being aware that you need to be careful not that you don't go overboard because you know, you want to make something work and you want it to be fun, but you want it to also not end up being in the realm of poor taste, especially if you're planning on streaming a game. I, I, my, my, you know, I tip a cap to people who are currently streaming horror, uh, horror type games because I, I've, I've thought about it and I plan on doing some of it. Um, but I also know that there are, definite choices that i will need to make and it and tools that i'll need to use to make sure that i don't go overboard and my players don't go overboard um it's a tricky thing now if you're doing it just in comfort of your own home do it have the uh with people that you know well and you know everybody's up for it and you know you, you maybe you have some loose set of rules that you're not going to go into or, or you're comfortable telling each other nope nope we're not doing that um, it's great. 
you know, I mean, listen, that that's a, that's a really a completely different thing as opposed to playing with people that you may know, but it, the, you know, people have their limits as far as things that they want to deal with. Um, so, you know, I, it, it's trying to find the new and interesting. Um, I, I do like using printed material, published material, not necessarily to run straight up, but finding some inspiration, finding the framework, uh, framework that I can use, um, you know, something that I can use as a jumping off point. It's funny that you should mention that, Pat, because for me, Castles and Crusades, the rule of cool is, tends to be in effect a lot of the time. Um, actually, for me, that's kind of one of the reasons I run CNC is, yes, you have your abilities. Um, you know, your character does have their specific abilities. Um, and there are, you know, there are certain rules in place for things that, uh, you know, that they can do better or worse. All right, Jay, I'll, I'll, I'll see you in a little bit. Um, but at the same time, one of the things that I, you know, I, I constantly remind my players is don't feel constrained to what is on your character sheet. If you want to try to do something heroic, uh, something, you know, something a little out of the ordinary, um, go for it. Uh, as long as there isn't a, let's put it like, unless there's really a specific rule regarding it, um, yeah, and those are usually basically trying to do something that belong to the realm of another character class. Um, unless there's some specific rule, then it's just a matter of, okay, let's figure out how this will work. You know, what kind of checks will you need to make? Um, figuring out whether it's something that realistically can be done in one round or does this become like a two part thing? Um, but as far as I'm concerned, you know, I want my characters. I want my players to try interesting stuff. I want them to do, you know, do interesting things with their characters. I don't want them sitting there staring at their character sheets like, all right, well, what 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 does my character have? Um, you know, I, I, I will admit I enjoy Pathfinder too. Um, you know, it's 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 a good game. There are a lot of rules, there's a lot of things covered. Uh, but I do think that comes at a cost. I do think it comes at a cost of player flexibility. And, you know, talking about inspiration, you know, part of inspiration is not feeling constrained. Um, if you're constrained too far, uh, then, you know, it, it's hard to be inspired because you're always worried that you're doing something wrong. And inspiration should go kind of fly in the face of what would be considered wrong. It's kind of the issue that a lot of people have when they're using a published setting, um, you know, I, I over and over we you know we see in the world of Greyhawk community, people admit and and these admittedly you know are people who are somewhat newer to the community, or maybe newer to DMing or you know just newer to gaming and such, talk about you know wanting to run a game like say in the world of Greyhawk, but they're afraid of doing something wrong. And this is where, you know, inspiration, where you have to look at the setting and I'm not going to call it canon. I hate the word canon. It, canon in the terms of TTRPGs is a nonsense term. Uh, it's a hill I will die on. Anyone who wants to fight me on it, I'm, I'm right here. Um, lore. There is the lore of the realm. There are the things that, as far as people know, these are the things that have happened. One of the interesting things that we find out about lore is what the things that we think have happened didn't necessarily happen the way we think they've happened. Um, especially when you're talking about a world where things have been happening for a couple thousand years and, you know, all we have is what was written down. Um, and as we know, history tends to be written by the victors. So, you know, there's, there's the lore. Uh, but lore can be malleable. Things happen, you know, things may not always happen exactly the way that we thought they happened. And you can work in that gray area. There's 
there is room there to, you know, to change things up a bit, make it work for your story. Um, even if you're doing a one shot in a published setting, you know, take inspiration from the lore of the campaign, uh, the campaign setting. Don't feel constrained by it. Only if they can read and write. Yep. <laughs> the, the, there, there's the other, you know, other thing that you kind of need to make sure that uh, you're, you're taken care of. If you can't read and write, uh, none of it, you know, all the written material in the world um, for, you know, people studying from the past isn't going to help. Um, but yeah, I mean, don't feel constrained in terms of, you know, the Lord thing, but use what works for you and it, it, use, and if, if you're not sure what to do and you don't want to go, you know, take a chance on going in the face of what published material says, find the stuff in between. Imagine what, imagine what might've been going on at a certain period of time. What's, you know, and what, could have happened that might still be of interest today, um, whatever today is in your setting. Um, you know, I, I did want to talk about, you know, going going in terms of other types of games, science fiction. I, 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 I'm not going to lie. I, I mean, in, in all honesty, I am a huge Star Trek fan. I've always been a Star Trek fan. We grew up watching Star Trek in my house. Since I was a little kid, um, it was... It was one. Uh, it was a syndicated show. It was on almost on a daily basis. Um, so you know, I mean, there was a point where I I had watched all of the original series over and over again, whichever ones were constantly showing. That they never did show all of them in terms of in syndication. So there was maybe fifty to sixty episodes. Fifty to sixty of the episodes. I, I've I've seen. Well, maybe it wasn't fifty. So yeah. I don't remember how many episodes there are. It's only three seasons, but seasons then were long. Um, whatever the, you know, whatever the rotation was, all those episodes I've seen over and over the, you know, Space Seed with, uh, with Khan and, you know, City on the Edge of Forever and, um, uh, what was the other one? The, I can never remember the name. It was like the, uh, the thermomite um gambit or something um there 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 are just certain ones that i you know i've i've seen over and over again and i i there was a time where i could almost recite them word for word it's been a long time you know i've watched the next generation um from beginning to end several times i've watched deep space 9 from beginning to end several times i've watched voyager from beginning to end twice um it, it 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 grew on me. It, it the first time I was, I had I wasn't the biggest fan of it. I I like some of it, but there there's some stuff that it, it, I just don't think they handled well. Um, but went, watching it over and over, watching it a couple times through from beginning to end, um, I became more of a fan. There's still some stuff about it that kind of annoyed me. Um, you know, you can't just I feel like they just whether the the realities of flinging two crews with two you know, the Maquis and the Federation crew together putting them together it it seemed like it was one of those things where <clears throat> they only made it a thing and they only had consequences from it when they decided they wanted to have an episode regarding consequence from it. Other than that, everything went smoothly. That is interesting, Cardman. I never realized that. Which canon? What what canon did it change, uh, Lord Fourth? I mean, technically, Star Wars. I mean, Star Trek: Strange New Worlds has changed canon as well, but I think Star Trek: Strange New Worlds is fantastic. It it is, um, you know, I I am enjoying that series like crazy. I'm actually in the middle of rewatching it again. I'm almost done with season two. I've got a few more episodes left, and then 
you know, just wait for season three to come out. Yeah, you know, here's the odd thing about that is the fact that Warp 10, the whole concept of Warp 10 being like the barrier and all that kind of fell apart when they started introducing the uh, trans warp drives and all that. Um, I, I, I don't remember the specifics, but I remember reading what the warp engines and all that, and these, these were books that were being published by, by, you know, as official Star Trek properties that, that made it sound like warp factors just kind of, became malleable and became a product of their various um you know their their various time uh their time elements and where you know where they were in terms of the story and what type of engines were out there and i mean you know if it if it, if it turns out that they never really explained it in the series um i'm okay with it, it that, i mean that's on on the list of things that can be changed, that that to me that was a small one. I mean, let's put it this way: uh, Star Trek: Strange New Worlds has changed everything you knew about the Gorn, and honestly, frankly, for the better, because the Gorn one of Gorn appearance in Star Trek: The Original Series kind of silly. Um, you know, the the Gorn in Strange New Worlds are free are just frankly terrifying. They're they're you know alien level. And when I say alien, I'm talking the series, nuke them from orbit. It's the only way to be sure, uh, type type thing. So, and the original, in the original FASA, I if so, I need to go look that up because I have, I do have the um, the FASA Star Trek RPG. I actually have the um the RPG as as well as the the Starship Combat uh box set. Yeah, yeah, Cardman, they they definitely are. I I I was like I, I watched the one of those episodes and it's like, all right, yep, nope, I'm on board with this change. Um it it, it is really, really cool. But, you know, it's interesting because as much as I love Star Trek, and I really, really love Star Trek, I mean, um, to this day, the the original Starship Enterprise is one of my favorite starships of all time. It, it is, when they, when they built that thing, when they put that, when they introduced the Starship Enterprise, it, it is, it is just a testament to beautiful design. Um, I mean... The thing just looks fast. It it it's you know despite the fact that it's supposed to be huge, um uh, you know and it, it just has that appearance. It's you know the symmetrical nature of the warp nacelles, the you know placement of the warp nacelles, um and it 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 when they do the like the single nacelle underneath the uh, underneath some of the ships. It just makes it scream out how much nicer that the Enterprise is. The fact that the the nacelles are out and behind, giving that you know feeling of pushing the ship faster through space. Um, it, it just, I think, honestly, you know, as as rough as as rough viewing, and it's not terrible. But when they released really Star Trek the Motion Picture, um, there's a reason why they spent a good eight not you know, I think it's about eight minutes of a shuttle flyby. The first time you see the uh Starship Enterprise in space dock and the shuttle goes around the entire thing. Part of it was again because the music for it, you know, they they had, had this massive orchestra. I I don't know if it's John Williams or who who did the or I don't remember who did the orchestra music for it, uh, which is which is great, but the awe of just watching and seeing you know this thing that you've seen on television if you're a Star Trek fan a thousand times 
and suddenly it is it was John Williams and suddenly you're watching it on the big screen and you get to see all the details and in a way that you've never seen them before and it's amazing and they knew what they were doing when they when they did that i mean it 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 took a hell of a long time um the movie itself kind of moved slow it was it was very much a 3 hour or two maybe not 3 hour 2 hour star trek episode as a movie uh but when when they when they took their time that was that was the first probably one of the really first things i've seen that i'd call fan sir the probably the first evidence of any movie i've seen where it was fan service it was it was here is your new refit starship enterprise in all its glory enjoy the close-ups i didn't have i didn't have the words for it at the time fan service wasn't a term that i became aware of until much later i mean the movie came out in what like 1981 or something like that um might might have been a little earlier i might might have been actually might have been in the late 70s I, I don't remember but oh my goodness when that happened it was amazing um and and you know it's funny because as much as i love star trek and i want to run star trek adventures as a game coming up with adventures for a star trek game frankly terrifies me because i trying to figure out how to run something interesting that isn't constant starship combat um which I mean, it's cool. I mean, you, you know, it's good to have some of it, but that can't be every game. Um, you know, is like having to find that kind of inspiration, going, having to go back and look at like all the shows and trying to find moments and things that work um, is, is again, it's a tricky, tricky thing. Um, I would probably have to like go through like, all the different sci-fi novels I have and go through and try to find things that I can work off of to make an interesting game. Um, another game I want to run is Mothership. Mothership is horror in space. Um, sci-fi horror. It doesn't have to be in space, but sci-fi horror of some sort. Um, so it's like trying to find interesting things there that don't feel like the same thing all the time. Um, and again, these are, these would be, end up being one shots. Cause again, this is a horror game. So likelihood of dying. Um, I, I mean, what, what would you, you know, for like a sci-fi game, where would you take inspiration from? Give me some examples. If you could, I'm, I'm, I'm curious to hear what you all think. Battlestar Galactica battle. <laughs> Battlestar Galactica. It's a good one. Um, you know, it's it's one of those things where Battlestar Galactica, um, especially like the the newer the newer series, finding finding a I, I I would you know for if I ever decided to do like a far from home thing, I would probably you know basically in deep 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 space and something having gone wrong. There's a number of things that I would end up pulling from. Uh, one of them would be Voyager, one of them would be Battlestar Galactica, and another another one. And this is a, this is a movie. Um, was it was it Pandorica or just Pandora or Pandorum? Um, Dennis Quaid. I remember Dennis Quaid was one of the stars. Um, it, it is a good one. And and even you know even some of the aliens out of the later alien movies, which aren't you know aren't quite as popular, but, but you know think finding things. And Orkin. <laughs> uh, that's gonna annoy me now. Uh, Pandorum. It is Pandorum. Yep. 2009 horror slash sci-fi it's a, it's a it's a good movie um viper fights or gunfights yeah, yeah um 
I mean, honestly, even even like a lot of uh, for sci-fi, there's also a lot of anime. Um, I love I love uh, mech related anime. I was always a big Robotech fan. Um, I've also watched the original, you know, the original Japanese anime, uh, the macro, uh, the original Macro Saga, and such. That sadness, uh, th you know, that's that's a great one. Um, exploring alien ruins, absolutely. Um, and a matter of making those alien ruins, and a lot for a lot Star Trek, a lot of it probably would revolve around that. Lost in space, yeah. Okay, all right. Lost in space is Lost in space is a good one. Um, you know, it, it's I, I I it's one of those things where I would probably want if I was going to do that, I'd probably want to like sketch out a bunch of ideas ahead of time because there's I think even more than D and D and D and D type games like Castle and Crusades and such. I think for sci-fi games, um, it requires it would require more preparation than normal because it needs even more than D and D. There, there, there's a greater um, there's a greater challenge in making sure that it makes sense. Uh, and 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 sometimes there's also the matter of making sure that you know you don't make it impossible for your players to figure out. But sometimes it's a matter of, you know, if they do something that sounds really cool, real, real cool, in effect, you know, make it work. Um, and I see we're in an ad break. I don't know how many of you are still with me. So one more time, I am going to remind you that we are sponsored by Troller Games. Um, we do have a $10 uh, gift card uh, giveaway currently going on. Exclamation point ticket to enter. And right now we have we only have a couple of entries, so your odds are good. Gateway Frederick Pohl. That's interesting. Uh Firefly, you know, Firefly is another good one. Um for pulling inspiration, that's for sure. Yeah, there there there's a whole bunch of ideas uh that you can work from there. I like it. I like it. The, the, these are all great ideas, and I I really appreciate all of you, um, you know, coming up with some some pretty cool answers, some pretty cool thoughts. And I I haven't. Let's put it way. I every single one that you've all mentioned, um, are are essentially a random adventure every week. Yeah, so more like a string of one shots. Which in a way, you know, if you, if you want to do a if you want to do an old school um star trek earth 2 wow you know i don't know that i ever saw the ending of earth 2 i watched i know i watched most of the episodes but i think i missed how the series ended and i don't remember if it ended on a um on a cliffhanger and got canceled or what happened but i know i watched most of it I know I had watched up until the point where they had made, uh, you know, where they became, had, you know, met the, uh, well, not even aliens, the indigenous group, because the people were the aliens, <laughs> technically. Um, but yeah, it, Firefly, there, there there's oh, so many that you can pull, but I, I was saying, you're talking about the essentially random adventure every week, which is, if you want to do what I, you know, jokingly, old school star trek uh that's the way to go is random adventures every week and a string of one shots because uh you know before before serialize uh television before serialized star trek which really it kind of sort of happened in next generation but it didn't really take uh for star trek until deep space nine deep space nine was heavily serialized you know the Every episode built on not necessarily one hundred percent, but more or less. You, you, if you missed one, you were in danger of missing something that you needed to know. Next generation, not so much. It, um, things would happen, and occasionally there'd be callbacks. And later in the series, it happened more often, um, where you'd have you know things 
uh, the, 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 the show changed based on what had happened prior, but early on it was still more episodic like the original series was. So, you know, it's, it's an interesting way to go. All right. So we are past 730. Um, I was a little worried that how long this was going to go. And I really, I, I want to say I thank you so much for, for all of you who have been here. Those of you have been chatting, uh, those of you, you know, lurking, um, you know, I appreciate you all. Uh, it, it, it's been, it, time has passed pretty quickly with, with the, with the chat going on. You all, you all have been great. Um, been a lot of fun. Um, so I do have, like I said, the giveaway is, is going on. Uh, right now I only have two entries. So there's a 50, 50 chance at the moment. Um, I will give it till 741. We 739 right now. Um, exclamation point ticket to enter ten dollar uh giveaway for troller games pdfs um otherwise i will pull and uh we are going to get ready to raid lord gazumba i know he's got his thursday night group going and this time i am actually going to remember to go to the stream ending screen i am also going to make sure that I remember to stop the stream once I've raided. All right, so let's do this. Um, uh, it is still 7.39. So you got it, well, you got something? Let's get the raid started. Ah, thank you so much, Halfling Wizard. Really appreciate it. Uh, we do have a giveaway going. Um, exclamation point ticket to enter for the uh, $10 giveaway for Troll Lord Games PDFs. Any, basically any digital product from their website. Uh, my next stream, I, I, there's a possibility that I might have a game going on Sunday. We're not sure yet. I've, I've been asked, I know it's Memorial day weekend, so, uh, please watch the discord. Um, my discord, uh, if you're interested in seeing a session, um, and let's get that giveaway going. Uh, I'm closing it now. Dat Sadness. All right. Congratulations, Dat Sadness. Um, uh, I don't know, Dat Sadness, um, if you want to get with me on Discord or I can get it to you here, um, you know, send me, a wi uh, send me a whisper either way, and I will get you the code. Congratulations. Uh, get your raid emotes ready, and um, again, I will possibly see you on Sunday. If not, I will see you next Thursday. Bye now.